Hey everyone, James Marin here, and in this video, I'm gonna talk about how to join the union. And by union, I mean specifically Local 600, which is the International Cinematographers Guild and applies to all camera department people. So that means cinematographers, camera operators, first and second ACs, DITs, uh, digital utilities, anything that is within the camera department. In this video, I'll go over the basics of how to apply, the requirements for joining, the benefits of joining, the cost of joining. Hello, I like money. Changes that you can expect when going union. That's my cat. And some tips and tricks to make your life easier during your application process. I'll also offer some advice on when to consider joining, how contract services is different from local 600, and what jobs count towards your days and what jobs don't. Lastly, because this video has so much information packed into it, be sure to check out the description below where I have it laid out into different chapters. This video is broken up so you could skip ahead if you like or go to something that is uh, more relevant to your current situation or if you just wanna have a quick answer, be sure to check out the description below. Also, I'm leaving a bunch of links in the description below to things that I'm talking about in this video, so be sure to check that out as well. Also, I wanna give a shout out to my friend, Matthew Boric, who really helped me in providing information in terms of the, how the healthcare works and how the pension works, so thanks a lot for your help. Lastly, shout out to everybody who responded to my Instagram stories where I was asking for uh, some of the information that you wanted to see in this video. So if you responded, thank you. Okay, so before we get into the process of how to join, let me first go over the benefits of joining Local 600. In my opinion, the biggest benefit is the ability and opportunity to work on union sets. You might be at the point where you're getting offered union work, but you're just not able to take it because you're not union. The ability to work on whatever project comes your way is a huge plus. Sure, you could try to get a waiver for the job that you're being offered, but in my experience, it's really, really difficult. Another big reason is the healthcare. Now, I just joined recently, so I haven't quite qualified for it yet, but from what all my friends tell me, it is some of the best in the nation. I'll get into more details on that later, but if you wanna skip ahead to that, check the description below. Another great reason to join is the pension and retirement benefits. When you qualify, you can get a retirement plan that acts similarly to a 401k and a pension in which you could draw income from every month after you retire. Another reason is the contracts and rates. The contracts negotiated by Local 600 serve as a floor for you to negotiate from, meaning you're not gonna get offers that are below that baseline that Local 600 is already negotiated for. And other more fun benefits include workshops for second and first ACs, workshops for film loaders, and workshops for camera operators as well. Sometimes there's also even private screenings of films that are just debuting and include Q&A sessions from the filmmakers themselves. Okay, so here are the basics of how to join. In order to be eligible for Local 600, first you need to join what's called the Industry Experience Roster, or IER. And in order to be on the IER, you'll need to have 30 union days or 100 non-union days. You'll also have to go through an organization called Contract Services Administration Trust Fund, or just Contract Services for simplicity, and it's completely different from Local 600. And for context, Contract Services is just an organization that handles all the paperwork during your application. You can think of them sort of like the DMV. And just so you know, in this video, I'm only going to be focusing on the 100 non-union day route because for the 30 union day route, it's simply a matter of working, well, really a matter of getting and working those 30 union days. Trust me, once you work those union jobs and you hit the 30 days, the union is gonna want their money. So they'll definitely be in touch. <laughs> money, please. Oh. Now you might be asking, well, if I'm not union, then how do I work those union jobs and get the 30 days? Now I won't go into it super in depth, but to answer it real quickly, you sort of have to get lucky and have the ability to get waivers in order to work those jobs. For commercials, waivers are given at the discretion of the agency that is creating the commercial. So unless you have an incredible relationship with the ad agency that's making the commercial, they're really not gonna go up to bat for you in order for you to get this waiver so you could be on the job with them. 
in their eyes, they could just get somebody else and it's easier for them. For things like TV and features, it's actually at the discretion of the producer. So if you have a good relationship with the producer or maybe you have a really good relationship with a DP, then at least you have some people that are going to push for you to be on the show and the producer, if they really want you or the DP says to the producer, hey, I really need this person to be on it, then there's more of a chance that that producer is going to go out of their way to get a waiver so you could work that job. Now for those 100 non-union days, it unfortunately can't be a mix of some union and some non-union. And it also has to be strictly one job classification, meaning you can't have worked second AC days and then a couple of first AC days and then some operating days. It has to be all one thing. It has to be all 100 days of one job classification. It also has to be done within a three year window. Now, here's the bad news. Not all of the non-union days that you're gonna submit to contract services are going to automatically get counted. Anything that is classified as web only, meaning that it's only gonna live online, probably won't count. For me personally, it was music videos. I probably submitted like 20 or 30 plus different music videos and unfortunately none of them counted. However, I definitely wouldn't let this discourage you. Definitely give it a try. Of course, things change over time and you know, maybe you watch this video a year later and things are totally different. So it's definitely worth a try to submitting them, but I definitely wouldn't count on it. So when is it a good time to start considering whether you should join or not? Everyone's situation is different and all of this is just my opinion, so take it with a grain of salt. Now, with that being said, I think a good time to start considering whether you should join or not is when you feel like you already have a fair amount of contacts who are already union or are working on union sets, or if you're already being offered union work fairly consistently. Maybe think of it this way, that when you start to have that problem of getting those union offers, but you obviously can't take them, then maybe it's a good time to consider joining and to start to organize all your paperwork and slowly or quickly submit all your paperwork in order to join so you don't have to pass up any more opportunities. However, if you've only gotten like one offer in the last six months, then perhaps it's a good idea to hold off on joining even if you already have all your days. Or you can join and expect to pay the initiation fee and the quarterly dues even though you're not working any union jobs yet, but perhaps you could use that as motivation to really hustle and try to make those contacts. So it's obviously all up to you. This is all just my opinion, but to give you context on what I experienced is I was getting offers probably for one or two projects every single month for quite a while that it felt like joining for me was the right move because I would probably continue to have those offers if I was already consistently getting them. It sort of hurt to not be able to take those jobs because it felt like you know, I was missing out on opportunities and things like that. But in reality, it was just a good problem to have because it served as a good indicator that let me know that it was time for me to make that leap. Now, I won't go super in depth on this, but uh, some of you did ask, so I wanna quickly answer it here about building those contacts and, and building that sort of union network. Now, the simple answer is that if you're an operator, then try to build more union DP contacts. If you're a second AC, then try to build more union first AC contacts. Don't forget to build relationships with producers and directors and even your own colleagues because a recommendation for a job can come from anyone. So really anyone that has work that you admire or just someone that you feel like you could reach out to because they seem like someone who is accessible and friendly is a good candidate in my opinion to try to build a relationship with that person. I also made an in-depth video on networking and some of my thoughts on that. So if you haven't seen it, feel free to click over here and it'll take you to the video. All right, next I'll outline the step-by-step -step process of how to join and all of the paperwork that's involved. So step one is to fill out the industry experience roster application. It's super easy and self-explanatory and I even left a link below where it leads you to a DocuSign for the application. 
Next, you'll have to go to contract services where you have to fill out an I-9 in person, or you could uh, fill one out on your own and then have it notarized and then send it in. But I suggest to just go to contract services because it's a lot easier. Step two is probably the most time consuming and the most important part of all the steps, and that's to turn in your proof of days and to turn in your proof of payment. For your non-union days that are also non-payroll, meaning you were cut a check for the full amount of your labor and no taxes were taken out, you'll have to turn in what's called an employment verification letter or EVL. Now I left a link in the description below to show you what it looks like and also so you can download a template that I made. Now the purpose of an employment verification letter is to have the producer that hired you sign it and that serves as your proof of days worked. Filling out the EVL is also very self-explanatory. It contains what your occupation is, what the job was, how many days it was, and whether it was broadcast on television or broadcast anywhere. It also must have the production company's letterhead or logo at the top of the EVL. And my template actually has a blank space for all this and is set up so you could just um, send it and have people just fill in the blanks. The EVL also needs to be signed by either the producer that hired you or a producer that works for the production company or one of the producers that worked on the project. And lastly, and probably most importantly, in the section that says the description and purpose of the project, you have to mention where the project aired. And again, if it's a web only project that's only gonna be on YouTube or Vimeo, it's probably not gonna count. If it's a commercial that you shot and it was broadcast on TV, then you'd put broadcast on television. If it's a feature film that went through the festival circuit, then you would put feature film for festivals or you would put um, for theatrical release. If you don't put anything down or you don't put a proper description, then contract services is probably gonna mail you something saying that they need you to elaborate on it or to actually put down a description. Now, here are a few tips on actually sending out the EVLs and getting people to sign them. The following day after the job was wrapped and I'm sending out my invoice, I would also include an EVL. The EVL was filled out and ready to go and all the producer had to do was put the company logo and sign it. In the email, I also included a quick description of what it was and why I needed it and it looked like this. Now, my pro tip for you is to create a sense of urgency. And in this case, I created a sense of urgency by saying the following. I think creating a sense of urgency is really helpful because you want to get those signatures as soon as possible. That would be great. Okay. Now, after you get the EVL back with the logo on the top and the signature at the bottom, the next thing you need to do is your proof of payment. My tip here is that when you get sent a check that you use your mobile banking app, which I'm sure you probably are, but if you're not, use the mobile banking app to actually cash in the check and then take that check and put it in a folder so that you could come back to it and take a photo of the check for your proof of payment either at a later time or if you're sending this right away, then you could already have it in the folder or when you get it, take a picture and then that will be your proof of payment. Now let's say it's time for you to actually turn in all your EVLs and your proof of payment. The next thing that you wanna do is actually email contract services. You'll have to email reception at csatf.org all the EVLs and the proof of payment until you hit those 100 days. All right, so all of that was just for the non-payroll jobs. For the jobs that were on payroll, the whole process is like a million times easier. In the description below, I left a link to the payroll company contact sheet that lists all the payroll companies or at least all of the major payroll companies that you'll probably encounter. Let's say for example, you've done 50 days of work and it was paid out entirely by the company Extreme Reach. Go to the contact sheet, click on this, and then fill out this page. What's easy about this is that you could put down an entire range of dates and approximate number of days that you worked and they'll find them all in their database and send an employment verification letter and proof of payment all on their own and on your behalf. So that's it, super easy with the payroll companies. Basically just rinse and repeat that process until you hit 100 days. And to be clear, as long as you're submitting non-union days, it could be a mix of non-payroll and payroll as long as it's under one job classification. Step three is to go to the contract services website and complete some online courses. This includes a general safety course, a harassment prevention course, and the newly added COVID-19 safety course. So after you've done your application and you've submitted all 100 days and you've done all your courses, the next thing that'll happen is that you'll be placed on the IER and Local 600 will be in touch with you. Okay, so now let's talk about the cost of joining Local 600. 
The cost of joining is really just dependent on your job classification. Although I don't know the specific cost of each job classification, it's anywhere between $5,000 and $17,000. So that's just your initiation fees. Then you have to pay quarterly dues. Your quarterly dues are also dependent on your job classification and could be above or below $1,000 per year. Lastly, you have to pay 1% of every check for every union job that you work for as long as you're in the union. So it's definitely a good chunk of money, but in my opinion, I think it's worth it given the fact that the union doesn't make any money any other way. All right, so let's talk about the healthcare. Quick disclaimer, I recently joined, so I don't have it quite yet, but all of this information is stuff I've gathered from other members or came directly from Local 600. The healthcare that you could receive from what I hear is some of the best in the nation, and it also includes dental benefits and optical benefits. The cost is also fairly low and is only $50 biannually, so $100 a year, and you can also add up to five different dependents for $25 each. When you go to see a doctor, there either is no copay or the copay is really low and is only $5. There's also several different plans to choose from, but of course that's a personal decision, but just know that there's uh, Blue Cross and Kaiser Permanente and several other options. Now, in order to qualify, you need to work 600 hours in a year, which equates to 50 days of 12 hour shoots. After initially qualifying, you'll only need 400 hours or 33 12 hour shoot days in a six month period or six month qualifying period in order to keep the insurance. And if you earn more than 400 hours, you could even bank up to 450 hours. Now the way that the bank of hours works is exactly how it sounds. If you end up working 100 hours over the 400 hour qualification, then 100 of those hours will be put into your bank. Now let's say that the next time you need to qualify, you only worked 300 out of the 400 hours. Well, because you have the 100 hours already banked, they'll just take that and then that'll get you the 400 that you need. However, there is a max of hours that you can bank and that's 450 hours. Also, if you have 380 hours and you don't have any banked and your qualifying period ends, then your insurance doesn't just automatically go away. You'll essentially get a grace period of one month. And if you still don't qualify after that month is over, you'll get another month. That grace period will continue to roll over month over month for up to two years. If you don't qualify within those two years though, then you'll have to start back over again and get the 600 hours to requalify. Lastly, you could check your hours at mpiphp.org. Now let's talk about the retirement plan and the pension plan, how it all works and how you qualify. Local 600's retirement plan is called the Individual Account Plan or IAP. The IAP is a contribution plan where the productions that you work on pay into your plan at 30.5 cents per hour that you work or are guaranteed work and 6% of your wages. To vest or to have access to your contributions, you need to work 400 hours within a one year period. You can think of the IAP sort of like a 401k in the way that once you actually are vested, you could pull out money in times of need. But of course, when you pull out money in any sort of retirement plan, you're gonna get taxed on it. Or you can wait and roll it over into an IRA or whatever else you might have. Now, in terms of the pension, this one's a little bit tougher. In order to qualify for the pension, a member needs to have five consecutive years of those 400 hours. The pension is separate from the IAP and is considered a defined benefit plan, which means that depending on the hours that the member worked and the number of years that the member worked, they'll have a defined monthly income that they get for when they retire. Lastly, you only get this benefit if you decide to retire at or after the age of 65. He's having fun. Basically, let's say you work on a ton of stuff in your career and you get those five consecutive years of 400 hours, then you're going to be looking at at least getting a pension where when you retire, you're gonna get that monthly income. All right, so a lot of you asked about protocols and what kind of changes one can expect when joining the union. Again, I recently joined, so my perspective is definitely very fresh. I haven't been in the union for years and years, not, not yet at least but maybe in the future I'll make a video and sort of come back to it. But for now, here are my thoughts. 
I would say to be mentally prepared to work with people that are going to be more experienced than you. I think that the real difference between union and non-union is that there is a set bar of experience in the union world, where in non-union, anyone of any level of experience can join the production. I've been on union sets where I haven't known anybody in the camera department or any other department in which I'd be working with in conjunction, but I was able to have confidence that all of those people that I'd be working with were going to be good at their jobs and have a level of experience. So in my opinion, it's really that level of experience and organization that really sets it apart. Now, in terms of the protocols, I don't think there's a huge difference, but maybe I haven't been in the union world long enough, but I think it's still the same common sense stuff that there is in the non-union world. The same way that you wouldn't be plugging in stingers and moving the set decorations around, whether it's because you want to be helpful or for whatever reason, um, is going to apply in the union world. In essence, if you stick to your job within your department, you're probably going to be in a good place because the last thing that you want to do is step on anyone's toes by handling things yourself. If you need something moved or you need something simple like an apple box, just ask. Or if it's something that you think you can handle, like let's say you're doing a close up on something and it's very specific framing and you have to move something around, then just ask for permission or ask for help. And in my opinion, this is why it's a great idea to meet all the keys at the top of the day. So usually I try to obviously meet the director and the DP, but to meet the first AD, the key grip, really those are the people that you're going to be working with in conjunction on any given project. But all of the set etiquette stuff are things that I've learned on the job because as you grow in your career, you start to work with more people who are more experienced and you might be on a non-union production, but perhaps a good majority or even a small minority of people are union and so you sort of pick up stuff as you go. All right, so that's it for today's video. Thank you for sticking it out on a very packed video. I know that this was a lot of information and uh, I don't know how long this video is currently yet because I'm recording it, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a long video. So thank you so much for tuning in today and for sticking it out. And I hope that this video was helpful to you. I hope that it provides you value and makes things easy for you in terms of your journey in joining the union. Thanks again for watching and I hope you have a great day.